Dave Nickars is the Vice President of Sea Shepherd Canada. Dave is a lifelong environmentalist with 25 years of activism under his belt. He's worked in forest conservation, marine wildlife protection, and campaigning to end the use of pesticides and other toxins. Dave stood up for the ancient rainforests of uh, Clayoquot Sound, British Columbia, the largest civil disobedience campaign in Canadian history. Dave played a key role in the successful effort to end logging in Manitoba's provincial parks. But perhaps most importantly, Dave um, has sailed with the mighty Sea Shepherd on a total of eight campaigns over 17 years, including the successful campaign to stop illegal whaling in the waters around Antarctica. Dave is a true hero to animals and the planet, and we're delighted he's with us here today. So the format is very simple. Dave will have about uh, 40 to 45 minutes for his presentation, and then around the five minute, uh, five minute mark, I will be waving from, like crazy from the outside to let him know that his time is up. And then I will move to Q&A, and he'll, he'll, he'll field questions on his own. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker of the day, Dave Nichols. Thanks, Jason. Uh, this is very exciting. It's a great turnout. And I'm honored to be uh, the local person, not only the only dude uh, speaking, but the only local person speaking at the first annual Olympic Veg Fest. So this is an honor in many ways. Uh, like you said, my name is Dave Nickars. Um, what I want to do with this talk, I was going to originally talk for about a half hour. Um, I'm going to try to keep it a little bit shorter than that. And then I want to have a Q&A for about half of it as well, because I find the questions are much more interesting than me just uh, prattling on about my experience. Although that's kind of interesting too sometimes. Um, sea Shepherd was started, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society was started in 1977 by Paul Watson. You might be thinking to yourself, is that Greenpeace? And we get that a lot actually, it's not, but Paul Watson was one of the founders of Greenpeace, and he moved um, away from that organization and started the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society in 1977. It's our goal to protect marine wildlife wherever we can. That's whales and seals and any other, any other species. And we often use international conservation law to do that. We also use direct action. Uh, the problem is there's hardly any enforcement out there for this conservation law. Many, many countries have signed on to agreements very interested in helping animals and, and to show that they're interested, but they have no intention of upholding these laws. You might remember that recently from the Paris Climate Accords. And our current government. My experience, uh, just a quick correct, uh, slight correction, I've been with the group for 19 years and I've been on 11 different campaigns. Um, I want to talk about two of the campaigns. The first one is the Antarctic anti-whaling campaigns, our most successful. And I also want to talk about Operation Virus Hunter, which is a salmon protection campaign on the west coast of our country in British Columbia. And uh, it's actually happening right now. There's things happening right now, which is, it brings it into the present moment. So ever since 2003, we've sent ships down to the waters around Antarctica to protect the whales in those waters. In 1994, this area was set up as a whale sanctuary by the UN. Uh, since 1986, there has been a ban on commercial whaling from the International Whaling Commission itself. There are also several other treaties that protect these animals from being transported, from being sold in markets. And every year Japan has tried to, Japan has sent a whaling fleet to go and try to kill over a thousand of these whales every year. So our first campaign was in 2003. And the best way to tell you about how we do this is to show you. So I'm gonna show you a quick video of 2012-13 uh, Antarctic anti-whaling campaign called Operation Zero tolerance, and you can see what you do, what we do for yourself. I think that the uh, the Ninth District Court injunction uh, emboldened the uh, the whalers, and they were much more aggressive this year. I think that they felt they could do whatever they wanted, and they had the backing of both the Japanese government and the U.S. courts.
In the past, an Ishamaru has tried to uh, hit us, but uh, we've been able to get, certainly get out of their way. But this time, we were holding our positions to prevent the refueling, and so, um, you know, they, I think they were initially, they probably thought they could bluff us and we'd just move aside, and then when we didn't, they were in a position where they uh, just carried on and hit, hit the vessels. I think that uh, an 8,000 ton vessel uh, striking a, a 500 ton vessel and pushing it into a 5,000 ton vessel uh, creates a, a very dangerous uh, situation. The Bob Barker was almost capsized because uh, the Nishamaru was pushing it over to such a degree. A few more minutes it probably would have capsized. That would have been an extremely serious situation. I don't think the Japanese captain really cared. In all of these campaigns, the crew are under the uh, understanding that uh, there are inherent dangers, that we're not just saying we're coming down here to risk our lives to protect the whales, we actually are risking our lives to protect the whales. And when putting our ships in a position to block their operations, we mean that we're there to block their operations. Now, there's no point in saying you're going to stand fast if you move out of the way at the last moment. If you're going to say you're going to stand fast, then you stand fast.
I've been involved with four of them, so I want to go quickly through the four campaigns I've been involved with and tell you a little bit more about them. Um, the first Antarctic campaign was 2002-03. It's over the, the holiday season, so we go down in November and we go uh, over the Antarctic summer. And we spent 46 days on the water. We visited the French research base on Antarctica. We got to meet penguins, which was the coolest thing in the world, and see all sorts of wildlife. But if you take a bunch of animal lovers and you put them on Antarctica where there's penguins and seals lying around, and they just go crazy. You have two hours to just suck it all in. Penguins and seals. Unfortunately, on that campaign, we found zero whalers. We spent 46 days on the water. That was a really hard trip back to port, um, but we, we did our best. My second campaign was in 2006-07, Operation Leviathan, and that's the campaign where I became a pirate. The Canadian government had registered our ship, uh, the Farley Mowat, and he was the international chair of the organization at the time. And so we got word, just before we left port to go to the Southern Ocean, that they were going to pull our registry, they were going to pull the flag from our ship. So we left early, because if they pulled the flag, we couldn't leave port. So we left port, and lo and behold, a couple days later, they pulled the flag. So what's a flagless vessel called? It's a pirate ship, and the crew on that ship are pirates. So we spent 50 days on the water, probably saved a few hundred whales, um, and at the end of the season, unfortunately, the Nishin Maru had got a fire in its processing facility, and one of the crew members had died. Um, we were called on to possibly help from New Zealand Search and Rescue, and we would have, because our job is to save lives. Uh, we were too far away at the time, and they were able to get their ship started and get back to port, but that also cut their whaling season short as well. Uh, the third campaign, so, so what happens in these campaigns is it's actually very simple. We find the Nishin Maru, which is the factory whaling ship, where all the whales get taken back to, and we chase that ship until we run out of fuel and we have to go back to port. That's the deal, right? That's been the sort of, you know, sacred understanding between us and the whalers. And if they don't run away, we, you know, we, we try to put ropes through their propellers and we, you know, sometimes we have a few collisions, but they're, they're not really that bad. They're just little bumps and a little bit of chip paint. So the deal is, we find you, you run away, we run out of fuel and, and go back. So this year, the 2008-9 campaign, they decided to kill whales in front of us. And they were testing us in that sense. So Paul Watson, uh, after they killed five whales, he decided, well, this is enough, and he collided with their ship. Uh, you can find the video online. And after that collision, they, they stopped doing that. So we convinced them. Um, part of the strategy is you have to convince your opposition that you're crazy enough to do whatever it takes to save the whales. And I think they can do this. My final campaign was the 2009-10 campaign. And we had a couple of new ships. We had the Bob Barker for the first time. We also had the Addy Gill. And the Addy Gill is a little Batmobile looking ship. It's a carbon fiber hull and it has, it's a trimaran. And it's really fast. It can catch up with all the whaling ships. Um, so it came down from Hobart and it was going to meet up with us. And what happened was the Yushin Maru number three had rammed it and actually disabled it to such a point where we had to abandon it. I'm going to show you a little bit of video of that right now. What you heard there, that high-pitched beeping sound, does anybody know what an LRAD is? It's called a long-range acoustical device, and it's used sort of to disperse. Originally, it was used by the military to disperse like pirates and things like that in the ocean. And it's been used in certain protests in the last few years. But it's a high-pitched noise that's supposed to not only just be annoying, but it's supposed to sort of disable you somehow. Um, it was too far away to have any effect, so it was just, a, it's just an annoying noise uh, during the campaign. But um, I'm just giving you a sense of 
how dangerous these campaigns can be. Um, if someone was sleeping up in that forward section, uh, they would have been easily hurt or killed. And um, this brings it to the larger question, of course, um, why do we do this? And I think the, the point is still there. We, we saved 932 whales that one year, and every year we go out, we spend weeks and months on the water. The shortest campaign I was on was 46 days, and the longest Antarctic campaign was 120. That's four months on the water. And it's right in the middle of the holiday season. You leave in late November, early December, you miss Christmas. You have Christmas on the ship and New Year's, of course. But you know, you're away from your loved ones and your family, and you're undertaking this, this campaign where you're you're at sea for days at a time doing the same thing. This this is this is the highlights. <laughs> this represents just seconds of what happens. But it's long, monotonous work being a crew member on a ship. And when we come back to port, we're super tired, we're stressed, we want to see our families and friends, we want to hit the bar. Um, and then the Japanese government comes up and says, due to Sea Shepherd's actions, we couldn't kill 500 whales this year. And of course, we get the reward right away. We got the reward of how many whales we got to save. Um, and that really makes it all work that I've seen crews that were just at each other's throats during the campaign, you know, not getting along, arguing. And then when they find out what they actually accomplished, it makes everything a whole lot better. So the second campaign I want to talk to you about is Operation Virus Hunter. It's a campaign where we're protecting wild salmon off the coast of British Columbia. The first one was last year. I was called on at the last moment to be an engineer on the machine. Again, you can guess who donated for that ship. Um, it's a sailboat. It's a 40-year-old sailboat. And it's, it's such a departure from our regular campaigns. We do a lot of confrontational stuff. And I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions about that. But this campaign was very interesting. We have someone called Alexandra Morton, who's an independent scientist out there. She's been protecting whales and salmon and studying this stuff for decades, 30 plus years she's been out there working for, for wild salmon. And the salmon farms are damaging wild salmon. They've been doing this for decades. Been, the, the evidence is there. And not only is the government ignoring the evidence, they're going after people who actually test the salmon for these diseases that are passed on to the, to the wild salmon. Um, I'm going to show you another quick video on that campaign. I've been working to protect uh, wild salmon from salmon farms for almost 30 years because uh, they're destroying this environment. They're interrupting the migrations. They're bathing these fish in disease. Wild salmon uh, are the bloodstream of this coast. So if salmon farms remain here, um, this coast is going to die. So I've tried just about everything, science, activism, gone to Norway, gone to the AGMs. And on May 23rd, Paul Watson posted on Facebook that he was sending me a ship, a research vessel, Martin Sheen, 81-foot vessel. I thought about it for a couple of days, and then I realized, yes, because I've tried everything, and it hasn't worked. And the Martin Sheen and Sea Shepherd in particular carries eyes from around the world. And people know that if Sea Shepherd shows up, it's serious. So I quickly began to cobble together a plan. And I, I had three objectives. And one was to do science. So um, survey the whole coast for a virus, Piscean Rio virus. That's why it's called Operation Virus Hunter. Take the boat to First Nations so that they could come on board and speak in their own voice and the world could hear what they had to say about the salmon farms in their territory. And I wanted to really look hard at these farms. I mean, I've been going up to these farms in my little speedboat for years. Imagine, now I'm coming with a ship. I learned things I have I've never known. I, I learned that herring have become addicts and they're, they're eating the food from these farms, interrupting their migration, bathing them in pathogens. And I got on a farm and put an underwater camera in there and saw that the fish are sick. I mean, a lot of them are sick, and that there's wild fish in there. Working with the crew of Sea Shepherd was just really one of the great joys of my life. I mean, 50 days on this boat, and uh, it, everything went so smoothly. I really want to thank Paul Watson for sending this boat, because I believe now, finally, we're going to get salmon farms off of a huge part of this coast. I don't think the industry is going to be able to survive that. While so many of us have worked at this, and I have put everything I have 
you know, have an am into this, I think this is going to make all the difference. So that was the summary of last year's campaign, and I was on for the, the second half. And as you can see on the, the blur machine, it's a, it's a luxury yacht, actually. It's a sailboat. And you have to be barefoot. It's, you know, I'm used to being in the Antarctic, you know, with, like, quite with dressed up for the, the cold. And all of a sudden, I'm on, on deck and in the engine with bare feet, which is very counterintuitive. But we went out, I, when I joined the campaign, uh, they had done some work with the First Nations community and the members of that community. And it, and it was a very strong bond. Um, one of the community members, she had, she had went to the fish farm with an eviction notice and went on the fish farm and the person who took the notice was one of her nephews who happened to be working there. So it was a little bit awkward, but they had a good time. You know, she gave the eviction notice. Then she went back to the community and she started just taking the kids and saying, get on, get on the Sea Shepherd boat. And we got these kids who were just shy, like didn't know what to say and we, we got to know them. And uh, they did a ceremony with about 15 people on one of the fish farms, sort of as a, as a, as a symbolic occupation. And it was really empowering. There was, there was like families there, and they had a little lunch, and they were in their regalia, like you saw on the, on the video. And then they said, let's do this again. And there were 60 people from the community that came out, and all these boats that delivered them. And the fish farmers were just like, okay, we're not going to stop you. This seems to be. And the thing is, you know, this is Treaty 1 territory, right? There's a treaty, there's, there's obviously problems with it in, in terms of how it's, how it's interpreted by the government. But in BC, there's no treaties, it's unceded territory. So this is a different situation, absolutely different situation. So in 2018, the fish farm licenses are up for review, and they just finished, um, actually they're still taking part in Operation Virus 102, which happened this summer. And instead of just occupying the fish farms symbolically, they set up a camp on them, and they decided to stay on them until they left. And they've been trying to block the uh, Marine Harvest fish farm boat. They have these giant tubes where they replenish the fish farm with fish and they, they collect the fish and all sorts of things. Uh, they've been interfering with that. And they're serious. They want these fish farms out of their waters. Uh, they see a massive reduction in wild salmon. Um, and other places in the world where there aren't fish farms, there's an excellent population of wild salmon. So it's a very, it's a very straightforward campaign. You've got to get people talking to, none of you are going to eat salmon necessarily, but we have to convince the larger public and outreach to people to stop eating farmed salmon, because the farmed salmon is damaging the wild salmon. It, it seems like, it seems counterintuitive. Oh, if I eat farmed salmon, I'm taking pressure off the wild salmon. It's exactly the opposite. So this year they're serious about it, and there's actually, there's, I think there's two occupations going on right now, and I encourage you to go look at these campaigns and see what they're up to, and uh, support them however you can. Um, so I don't have, how much time do I have left, uh, who's the timekeeper back there? So I think I have about a half an hour left, yeah, and I want to start a discussion. So I'll probably have a few, I'll, I'll take a few minutes at the end to sort of wrap up, but uh, I'd like to answer questions and see if anybody has any questions. <coughs> That was actually from the Yushin Maru number three. They, took a pic they, they filmed themselves ramming our ship and then they released it. Yeah, I know, it doesn't seem like it makes sense. We actually have footage from the Bob Barker, which is about 250 meters away, filming it, and you see it from the front. And actually, the whaling ship, like what you see at the last moment is the collision. The whaling ship actually took a large turn, and it was leaning over as it turned towards the, uh, the Addy Gill of the Batmobile. So they intentionally hit the ship. And, destroyed it. Um, again, luckily no one was hurt, but I also think that carbon fiber ships shouldn't be in the southern ocean, because there's ice down there too. And we've had a lot of trouble in ice if you've seen whale wars. What are the most important things that you have That's a good question. It's actually taken a few interesting legal turns. So, in 1994, the UN established a whale sanctuary around the waters in Antarctica. So, about 200 miles out from shore is this supposed to be a sanctuary. Um, this was signed on to by all the nations. Back in 1986, there was so much whaling going on, the International Whaling Commission itself decided, we got to stop commercial whaling. And what happened was, 
Japan decided, oh no, we're gonna we're gonna keep whaling, but we're gonna call it research. So there's a loophole. You can go and do lethal research whaling, and but it, it was the same numbers they were doing for their commercial hunt. So they were using sort of like a loophole. Now every year the International Whaling Commission would say this is not a, a reasonable loophole. You can get data from this this research without killing the whales and selling them in the markets. Um, and Australia actually made a complaint to the International Court of Justice in The Hague and was finally heard in 2015. And what happened was the Court of Justice said, yes, the whaling fleet from Japan is violating several international laws and they need to stop and there's no avenue for appeal. It's clear that you're violating the law. And it was the most one-sided, it was an awesome victory for the whales. They decided to stop whaling for one year in the 2015-16 season. They said, okay, we're not going to go out this year and we're going to re revamp our whaling program. And so they decided to go out again the year after that and kill, instead of 1,035 whales every year, they're going to kill 300. So it's only a third is illegal, I guess, or, or whatever they're thinking is. So right now, they're killing a lot fewer whale, whales. And um, I guess it's, a be it's better than it's better than a thousand, I suppose. Uh, so I think it's got to end. Like there, there's hardly a market in Japan for these whales. A lot of the whale meat, and I'm talking thousands of tons of whale meat, is in storage. And for the people who don't buy it at the high end, like there's a there's a bit of a market where people buy it for for you know whatever whatever they think is is a delicacy. And most of it, they try to feed to school children. They don't want it because they it's. It's not to their liking, and a lot of it ends up actually getting ground up and fed to animals for agriculture. It's a, it's a strange thing, and it, it's not to, not to point out Japan. Um, you know, Canada has our seal slaughter. Uh, the Faroe Islands in the North Sea have their pilot whale kill. I mean, there's there seems to be a few countries that have this irrational <laughs> need to kill the animals, um, and of course, Canada is one of them. Um, so the laws, there's actually laws out there, and it took years of pressure from the Australian people to their government, and I'm talking years and years and years, uh, to get them to make that complaint in the, in the International Court of Justice. So I think the law is on our side on this one. There's about, there's about three or four other treaties. There's the CITES Treaty, where you're not allowed to send um, red-listed species uh, transport for commercial purposes. There's, a, there's other laws as well, but if there's no one enforcing them, they don't really have a lot of teeth. Um, again, I come, I come back to the Paris Climate Accord. Like, what's what's the result if, if Trudeau doesn't? Uh, not to get too political here, but what, what if Trudeau doesn't actually follow the, the Paris Climate Accords? You know, who's going to stop them? And it's all, it's really up to us. Sorry, there's a question. Are there any laws against a ship ramming purposely ramming another ship? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, every time we get into a collision. Um, we would come back to shore, and what I would do is I would look for the the police, the police buses, you know, to take away the crew. And every time I came back to shore, all I saw was two two police cars. And so we would have a collision with their ship. There'd be a complaint from the Japanese government to the Australian government because that's the country we were going to, and that was our port of call. They would come in and say, "Oh, there's been a complaint." And then two hours later, we'd be at the bar having a drink. So. There must be rules against it, but we haven't been, been held to account for them just yet. <coughs> Predator versus prey in its ratio. Um, that's a good question. Can you be more specific? Um, for example, if you come up with one particular uh, species and its potential uh, to exceed the other. Okay, so you're talking about basically justifications for hunting? Yes. Okay. Um, there may be a justification for hunting, but the way I see this kind of action, like humanity's history with whaling, for example, has been, I'm going to wipe it out before somebody else does. That's really the bottom line with the whaling we've undertaken over the years. If you can show me a good example of that kind of management, I mean, as a vegan, as a vegetarian, I am not too impressed with hunting, and um, I wouldn't do it myself, but our history with animals, with endangered species, is pretty obvious. We're very bad at management. Um, and it's shown over and over again. Whales, seals, um, fishing. Oh my gosh, most of the fisheries are in trouble, never mind uh, climate change effects. So, actually, yeah. I, 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 I,
Yeah, they do, but they also meet the predators of the fish we want, at least at this particular time in history. So there's, there's a complex relationship. It's not just, I think the mistake is to think that if there's less of one, there'll be more of another. It's, I don't think it's that simple. And I think that's, that's something that needs to be proven. Um, and some animals, like the, for example, the seals, I can't believe they can take the amount of destruction they have taken. They, they, they go out and kill hundreds of thousands of them. In fact, the, the seal hunt has been a lot smaller because of markets, but in their big years, they've taken 300,000 exclusively young seals that are just learning to swim. Um, it's arguable whether or not you can call them babies, but I, they're essentially, uh, they had just, just weaned from their mothers, but they can't swim yet, so they're like they're toddlers. Um, they've been able to take a huge amount of predation from humans and still maintain their populations. It's actually amazing. I, I don't understand how that works. But ocean ecology and, and animal ecology and populations is much more complicated than if there's less of one, there's more of another. But I'd be happy to talk to you more about that after. Are you tracking the results of Operation Viper Center, or what's the demand of more farms and sit for The west coast of the U.S. And California seems to be a huge market for farm salmon. It seems to be sort of the darling of the, the chefs and the, the restaurants. I'm like, oh, farm salmon, yes, that's the choice. But this year, actually, there's been a lot more media coverage. People are learning that farm salmon isn't the, isn't the savior that it, it's supposed to be. I think there's other markets, but I think the west coast of the U.S. is actually the biggest. where I'm trying to sleep. I'm on that ship and I'm trying to get rest and uh, it's not a great way to wake up, I can tell you. Okay, sure. Is it vegan or all the ships The ships all have vegan food served, yeah. And that's been that way since about the late 2000s. It hasn't always been that way, but one of the, one of the messages is, you know, a lot of what's taken out of the ocean is fed to farm animals and we want to have an impact on Marine wildlife, we should go vegan. I've been vegan for 25 years, and that's one of the reasons why I, why I stopped eating uh, animal products, is to reduce suffering and reduce the pressure on our wildlife and reduce pollution. So, again, that's one of the many things you can do. Recently in Washington, there was a huge spill of farmers' pits. Oh, yeah. And uh, they were saying that they were migrating up to. The fishermen in that area are actually catching Atlantic salmon. I think there was hundreds of thousands of Atlantic salmon released in that fish farm accident. Um, it's biological pollution. It's the cats out of the bag. We can't we can't take that back. Um, they're in the ecosystem. Hopefully they don't survive and, and start their own salmon. But lot, the reason why, they, and in these fish farms, guess where they use the salmon from? They don't take all these BC populations of salmon, coho, and uh, the other ones. They, they don't use those for the salmon farms. They use Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon are, are the most aggressive salmon. They're, they, they, they're more aggressive and they survive better in these fish farms. So that's what we have in the fish farms. You're growing Atlantic salmon on the west coast, and when they spill, you've just polluted, biologically polluted that area. I don't know what the long-term implication is, and I don't know what can be done about it. It's, it's, it's simply, it's like, how do you pick all the fish out of the water that are the, the wrong fish? It's a very good question, and I think the damage has been done. Yeah, in fact, wild salmon um, are so important to the ecosystem. Alexandra Morton has written in her book, and she said it out loud so many times, there's a hundred different species that predate on wild salmon, and they take it out of the water, and they leave it on the land. So there's bears, there's eagles, there's all sorts of birds that eat wild salmon. And that salmon is supposedly responsible for the big trees you see in BC, because they've been sort of fertilizing that landscape with these salmon after they eat them. 
over you know thousands of years. And it's such a complex ecosystem, and it's amazing. Um, and yeah, we have to save the wild salmon. We've got to get the fish farms out. I'm very interested to hear your comments on, um, we talk about fishing and fishing products being fed to animals for agriculture, but what about fish that's being used to feed domestic pets? And yeah. as vegans, if we own domestic pets who cannot thrive on anything else other than the animal byproducts, then where do we draw the line when we want to stop these industries? because there must be billions of dollars spent in uh, domestic pet food products, and we're robbing our oceans to eat our cats' tuna and salmon. So I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, the pro I have two cats myself, and I think I, when we buy the cat food, I think, oh, I'll stay away from the, the, the salmon and the fish ones, but where do the other animal right. products come from, right? So, I mean, there's no perfect answer, but yes, we do have a problem with so how, how, how does the pet industry, the pet food industry, impact our oceans and, and fishing? What is the percentage of that? That's a good question. I don't know. It must be in concert with the uh, animal agriculture of the humans because the byproducts would be used, I imagine, for the pet food. Um, yeah, that's a good point. We, there is a lot of damage being done to the ocean. We really have to think beyond. I think so. I think we have to, you know, if we're going to take our activism and our beliefs and our morality to a certain level, I think we have to start reaching the point where, yes, we all love animals and we want to do what's right for animals, but if we continue to contribute to an industry that's causing so much damage that we can have a catacomb, we have to bring it, start maybe bringing it to another level. Yeah, good point. Thank you for that. Uh, are there any uh, campaigns that Sea Shepherd Canada is going to be involved in, like, like in the future, I guess, like in the relatively near future? Uh, good question. Um, I don't know what's happening with the seal hunt this year. Uh, sea Shepherd Canada was involved with the Operation Virus Center, of course, because we've split up into chapters, but they all work sort of in the same, in the same realm. But if you are interested in volunteering, come talk to me afterwards. We can, we can talk about that. Um, there's, there's ways to get on the ship. You can, you can imagine there's, there's a lot of people in the world that want to get on these ships and help out. And if you have no ocean-going experience, that was me in the mid-90s. And I've seen people get on those ships with no ocean-going experience. We take first-time sailors to the worst weather and oceans in the world. Um, and it's pretty funny. I, I, get, <laughs> I get seasick the second day out for about four hours. It's my toll I pay for being in the ocean. So I get sick, I feel it, I'm like, oh, food smells horrible, oh, I got a bit of a headache, and I just, you know, either throw up or don't. But I get over it in about four hours, and some people don't get over it for weeks, they get sick again when there's a storm or rough water. Um, I'm fine, you can go back to port and refuel for three days and then go out again and I'll be fine. But um, some people actually, like the feeling I have for those four hours, if I could press a button and get back to shore, um, I would, I'd be like hitting that button, like, yep, I'm gonna go back, because it's, an, it's the worst feeling in the world. But I know people who are sick for weeks on those campaigns, but they push through it because they want to do something. Although, if you're sick, you can't do something. <laughs> but yeah, seasickness is terrible. Um, I just wanted to get in here that one of the seasons you went out, you didn't, uh, you didn't uh, track down the Japanese whaling fleet. Yeah. How do you, is there a technique you use to kind of scope out where they might It's a combination of a lot of things. We have uh, friends in militaries around the world that sometimes pass us information. In fact, in the 2006-07 campaign, our friends from Greenpeace were also down there with the ship. Uh, there's a there's a really there's there's two two movies. Um, long story short, the, the person from the Greenpeace vessel gave us the coordinates when they found them. But we get we get information from research vessels from people who fly over on the planes for the military and they're like, oh, there's the coordinates, and they email them to us. So we, we do get a lot of tips. And sometimes it is blind luck. You have to go down there, and it's huge, like the Ross Sea. Oh, it's just the biggest place in the world, literally. Um, so in the 2006-07 campaign, we had a Greenpeace ship and we had the Sea Shepherd ship, and uh, two Sea Shepherd ships actually. So we were we were offering to work with them. You know, hey, if you find the whalers, tell us, and if we find them, we'll tell you. They, they wouldn't, 
they didn't have none of it. Now the crew were cool. We actually have crew going back and forth from both organizations. But the leadership of Greenpeace really didn't want to work with us. It was bad for their brand image, I guess, or they were worried about being branded as violent or whatever. So there was a documentary about us called At the Edge of the World. So you could see all of our campaign and how that all worked together, including their interactions with Greenpeace. And then there was um, Battleship Antarctica, which was a, a BBC4 show about the Greenpeace ship on the same campaign. And you can see the interactions from their point of view. And it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Um, the Green the Greenpeace crew wanted to work with us. And at, at one point, they found the whalers, and they didn't tell us where they were. And we were like, you know, we, we know you found the whalers. Tell us where they are. And they're like, no, we, we don't want to work with you. And when we found the whalers, we, we gave them the coordinates. And we said, come on, you know, the more the merrier. And they stayed away. They stayed away. And then that was the campaign when the Nishan Mar were caught on fire and the Greenpeace ship had to just sit there and wait. I mean, they offered help, of course, because that's what you do in the water. But uh, it's a really interesting, it'd be an interesting double feature to show both of those films. And, and it's from the two crews' point of view. Yeah, I just I wanted to know your comments about uh, our oceans. I mean, I, I understand the anti whaling but what are your ideas or comments about how we clean up the oceans? Because human beings, it seems to me, are just using it as a dump for plastic. So we all hear about the plastics, and that's having a huge effect on on, on marine life. So mm -hmm. so so what can we do about that? Oh gosh, <laughs> that's a huge question and it's super important. We're going to be spending millennia cleaning up the oceans. And everybody should probably expect to participate in that somehow. And literally everybody. They're, they're, we have to stop making those plastics and we have to stop. And we have to filter out that pollution as best we can. We've got to stop putting carbon in the atmosphere because most of it goes into the oceans. Um, the coral reefs are dying. I've, I've heard people like, last night at the meet and greet talking about diving on the coral reef back in 2008. There's been major bleaching situations then. We have to put all of our effort into helping <coughs> the oceans because that's where a lot of the life comes from in this world. It's a lot of where our oxygen comes from. Um, the oceans are rising. I mean, the, the reason why they have so many floods in Houston and uh, Florida is because on average, all the oceans have risen, risen eight inches, and in the southern U.S., it's 12 inches. So it's not the same everywhere. Um, I think we all have to do something, and we have to tell future generations that, sorry, but your job from now on is to help help the oceans and help the world. And are, I think that's really how it's happening. Are there any efforts by the UN to inhibit uh, garbage dumping? Yeah, yeah. Well, they have in the past. If, if they are, that they may not be effective, right? I mean, the, the thing is, in 1992, I believe, the UN saw that there was a problem with drift netting. So they said, we're outlawing drift netting. And the next year, 1,500 drift net ships went on the ocean. And Sea Shepherd went after a couple of them and got into a couple of scuffles. But really, it's, it's our governments should be doing these things. Our navies and our coast guards should be doing these things. And really, that's what our that's what our military should be for. We should be basically take those resources instead of fighting each other in, in these silly wars. We should be uh, helping the oceans and dealing with climate change. In terms of locating uh, the whaling ships, has any considered the location of the Greenpeace ships? Because it's not just the drones. Yeah, some of the footage from Operation Virus Hunter was was taken with drones. We were actually able to see in the pens very well. Um, we had some longer range drones like in the, in the tens, tens of miles, but it's a very big area. We actually had, um, on several of our campaigns, we've had a helicopter. And we, we have helipads on both ships, so the ships can be far away and the helicopter could do a big search. And it's actually helped quite a bit. So yeah, the aircraft have helped us, uh, even our own. Um, in the film, Missions of the Deep, there's a about a tourism boycott? Well, no, that it may be more uh, protest or activist boycott, so it doesn't seem like the economy, because from what I understood, was it kind of kept the hunt going anyway, it backfired. Um, they, would, they would continue the hunt just to bring more protesters and to stimulate the economy. 
I've never heard that. In fact, I haven't seen the Peter Brown's film. Um, I should. I should take a look. Sorry, Peter. Uh, I should take a look at your film, Operation or uh, Confessions of an Eco Terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's good. I'll, I'll have to do my homework on that one. But uh, good point. Who has a who's There you go. What implications do you have uh, on work as Sea Shepherd when it comes to inhibiting the reality? Is it like a moral? Is it legal? How far is it far? Well, we, we do our best. And then, of course, when you see the collisions and those kind of actions, um, we do our best not to hurt anybody. You know, we are ostensibly nonviolent. Um, here's a funny story. Yeah, we, we, we do have a moral obligation not to hurt anybody. We do put a fear into them, for sure. But uh, in 1998, the Dalai Lama had sent us a letter sort of commending us, saying, you know, your actions are, you know, some of them are pretty, um, sometimes can be frightening, but he compared it to a, uh, a Buddhist concept of frightening people into enlightenment. And he said, you're doing good work, you're doing nonviolent work. And uh, a few years ago, the Dalai Lama sent us a letter because we had thrown, on the deck of the ship, we throw these bottles full of what's called butyric acid. It's a very mild acid. In fact, it's the same acid that's in your stomach that makes your vomit smell horrible. So we throw that on the deck of the ship. And he sent a letter saying, and I'm paraphrasing, hey, well, slow down, buddy. Like, stop, stop doing that. That's, that's too much. So we took it under advisement and we stopped doing it. But uh, we did get an endorsement and then a, um, you know, a harsh few words from the top of the month. <laughs> But no, it, you know, it's good. We'll take advice where we can. But we, I mean, other than the fact that sometimes we put some we put some fear into people that are doing things illegally, um, we are as nonviolent as possible. And of course, when you are out in the waters, um, you get to actually see these animals up close. You get to see, like, we. I was having a conversation on the back deck of the Steve Irwin, and off in the distance there was a humpback whale jumping out of the water over and over again as we were talking. We look over and this humpback whale's jumping out of the water. Just absolutely gorgeous. I've seen blue whales, I've seen um, all sorts of animals. Penguins are ridiculous, they're the funniest animals in the world. They can't walk on land properly, but they swim like dolphins. And as you take your small boat from the big ship to the shore, they jump on your boat because they, they think it's an iceberg. So you get penguins all of a sudden in your boat. And you have to um, that's, that's again, I'm bringing it back to the reason why we do it. Um, but yeah, we do have some limitations. Legally speaking, um, yeah, we do take that into consideration too. We can't, um, we can't take actions that will result in, in large legal penalties. Um, we do our best to avoid that, although sometimes we get arrested. I was arrested on one of the CLM campaigns along with the entire crew. Um, in fact, Camille Labchuk is going to be talking about legal issues in one of the upcoming uh, workshops, and uh, she's, she's worked with Sea Shepherd as well, um, which will be interesting. I want to go see her talk to her. But yeah, there are other issues. Did what tweaked you or inspired you to get on these missions from the beginning? Mm. I was in the audience for one of his talks at the University of Manitoba, and um, I had never heard of the organization before. And I saw a placard outside of the University of Manitoba, back when I was in engineering, I dropped out. But um, it was Paul Watson. He rams ships and saves animals, and I was like, well, oh, cool, that sounds fun. And I saw Paul Watson speak at the University of Manitoba in 1991, and he was very inspiring. He was straightforward. He said, we go out there, we want to, like he said in the video, we want to stop the, the destruction of our oceanic wildlife. And um, that's when I was hooked. I followed the organization for a few years. I applied for crew, and it took three years to get back to me because I had no experience whatsoever, and I learned on the job. And uh, yeah, 19 years and 11 campaigns later, that's, that's where I am. Um, I'm also interested in reducing animal suffering, and one of the ways you can do that certainly is become vegetarian or vegan, but you can also go beyond yourself, and you can go out and, and help, help uh, wildlife where you can and reduce suffering when you can. So I think that's maybe, I got about 10 minutes left. That's maybe where, we'll take a couple more questions, yeah?
And that's a very good point. How do you stay inspired when there's so much happening around you? Um, taking some sort of action is helpful, psychologically. Um, I was on the Canadian Seal Hunt campaign twice, in 2005 and 2008, and there's no worse thing for an animal lover to see than the, than the Canadian Seal Slot. It's the worst thing you can imagine. It's partly why I'm not talking about it, is because I suffered some post-traumatic stress after the first one in 2005, but then in 2008 our ship was arrested and suddenly the media was interested and I was able to at least speak for the seals. Um, taking action helps, helps the brain. It really does, because I, I actually can't even watch those videos anymore. I mean, I'll watch um, Confessions of an Eco-Terrorist, but people are like, oh, there's an Earthlings video. I watched it once, and I'm like, yeah, I don't need to be traumatized anymore. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't watch it. You, you know, go and, go and do what you need to do. But um, doing something about it is very important. And, and whether or not that's personally, as being vegan or vegetarian, or being an advocate, or even helping with this conference is a very, very good way to, to help with that. Um, it means you've done something. So you know, instead of instead of worrying in front of a computer screen, it's it's good to get out there and do something. I got about five minutes left, so I think I'm going to do my my final wrap up now. Um, I think I've actually covered quite a bit of it with your questions, and I think I think they're wonderful questions. It's it's really difficult looking at this stuff sometimes. I'm sure everybody in the room has sat in front of the the computer screen or a television or at a film, you know, going, "Oh look, slaughtering all sorts of animals and treating our." Agricultural animals, like I, I can't believe what what humans are capable of. Um, it's 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 so disheartening in a lot of ways. But as some of my activist friends and some of the people who organize this conference can tell you, there's there's a little bit of solace in taking action. Um, you have to figure out what's right for you. You know, I, I'd be glad to have you on one of these campaigns. I'll take you all. It's it's great. But I've volunteered for those four Antarctic anti-whaling campaigns. Most of my campaigns I've volunteered for. That's four months away from home during the holidays. I'm making no money and I'm spending about $2,000 on the airfare. Um, that's not for everyone. And there are many things that you can do here. Uh, that There's animals that need help here in the province, in the city. And um, one of the other ways I'm helping, and hopefully can make a difference, uh, I ran for the Green Party in 2016. And I almost won the Wolseley seat. I was just under 400 votes away from winning. And politics is a crazy game. But more and more Greens are getting elected across this country. And they can have an effect, and they are having an effect on how laws are passed. And uh, for those of you who sat through the Animal Care Act consultations and got disheartened by that, um, maybe if there was a Green in there, it would have been a little bit better. And that's what I want to do as well as my activism. The activism is not over. I might go out again to the Sea Shepherds, but uh, I want to leave this in the political realm because we have, in my estimation, and a lot of you might agree with me, there's a few there's a few MPs out there and a few MLAs that perhaps are sympathetic, but there's really no political representation for people who care deeply about climate change, about animals, and uh, that's that's one more place I want to go with this. So I think I'm going to wrap it up. It's 10:26, and if anybody wants to talk to me after, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. And thank you for coming. Thank you.